Polls opened in Russian presidential election on Friday. President Vladimir Putin has appealed to voters, including those in the annexed parts of Ukraine, to be united in determining Russia's future in the presidential elections. Meanwhile, early voting began on Sunday in the four regions in the eastern Ukraine annexed by Russia in September of 2022. Megumilim has more from Kiev. As Russia heads into the presidential elections this weekend, early voting had already begun on Sunday in the occupied regions of Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia and Kherson in eastern Ukraine, reportedly for, quote, security reasons. These four regions were annexed by Russia in September of 2022, but is only partially controlled by Moscow. And its claim over these territories has been rejected as illegal by Ukraine and most countries in the United Nations General Assembly. Ukraine has said it will consider Russian votes in these regions as void and that it will also prosecute observers sent in to monitor the voting process. The Kremlin-backed news agency TASS reported that early voting in some areas close to the front line began even earlier, since February 25th. The Institute of the Study of War said in its assessment that Russian-installed officials in these occupied territories are expected to fabricate a larger voter turnout in an aim to legitimize Russia's control. President Putin's win is pretty much guaranteed, but a high turnout would help the Kremlin's effort to justify Russia's invasion of Ukraine. There are three other candidates on the ballot, but none of the others have posed a real challenge to Putin. Opinion polls show he is widely supported by a majority of Russians. One survey last month reflected a 75% support. His win in the elections would give him another six years in office. Megumi Lim in Kiev reporting for DD India. All well, updates now on Russia-Ukraine conflict. French President Emmanuel Macron said Europe should prepare for war if it wants peace, citing Russia as an adversary that would not stop in Ukraine if it defeated Kyiv's troops in two-year-old conflict. If the war were to spread in Europe, it would be Russia's only choice and responsibility. But to decide, us today, to be weak, to decide today that we would not respond to it, is already to be in defeat. But that I do not want. And meanwhile, German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock said there would be no end for the joint international and joint European support for Ukraine. Putin believes that Ukraine will sooner or later run out of weapons and lose international support. He's completely wrong because we have staying power and we are not letting up in our joint international and joint European support for Ukraine. And we know that all the different elements are needed for the support of Ukraine. Für die Ukraine nicht nach. In a tragic incident, as many as 60 people are feared to have drowned on a vessel carrying migrants across the central Mediterranean from Libya to Italy. The central Mediterranean is one of the world's most dangerous sea migration routes. According to the UN Migration Agency, almost 2,500 migrants died or went missing last year and 226 since the start of 2024. And the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, said Ukraine is running out of ammunition and NATO members are not doing enough to help Kyiv on Thursday. There is no imminent military threat against any NATO ally. NATO continues to ensure there is no room for miscalculation in Moscow about our readiness to protect all allies. With more forces, higher readiness and increased defence spending. The request of former U.S. President Donald Trump's request to dismiss a criminal case was denied. That charges him with illegally holding onto classified documents after leaving the White House. The ruling by U.S. District Judge Eileen Cannon in Florida came just hours after a hearing in which his lawyers argued that the central charge is in case is improperly vague. Cannon was appointed to her post by Trump. She ruled that question warrants serious consideration but should not be decided at this point. Trump has pleaded not guilty to a 40-count indictment that accuses him of illegally taking sensitive government documents with him when he left the White House in 2021. 
It's one of four criminal cases he faces as he tries to win back the White House. Donald Trump is expected to win the Northern Mariana Islands Republican presidential contest on Friday. The 14-island nation will help the former president add to his delegate count ahead of November's presidential election. Deed India's Nick Harper reports. The Northern Mariana Islands are actually nearer to China than mainland United States, but they are a U.S. territory and therefore holding the Republican Party caucus this Friday, with Donald Trump looking to clinch all nine of the available delegates that are up for grabs. Trump, of course, is now the only contender in the Republican primary race and earlier this week won enough delegates in the state primaries to become the party's nominee. It means he'll go up against the incumbent Democratic President Joe Biden in November's election. Biden himself won the Northern Mariana Islands Democratic primary on Tuesday. Around 55,000 people live on the islands in the Pacific Ocean, which formerly became a U.S. territory back in 1986. The southernmost island of the territory, Guam, an important U.S. military base, holds its Republican caucus on Saturday. However, while the territory can vote for presidential nominees in the primary contests, the residents there cannot vote in the general election come November. Nick Harper in Washington, reporting for DD India. While there are 134 hostages still remain in Gaza and families are continuously demanding an immediate release, thousands in Israel took to the streets on Thursday calling for the release of hostages marched from a Tel Aviv square. Protesters carried enlarged images of women taken hostage by Hamas terrorists on October 7. Talks. We want people, we know that bringing them back alive is by talking, by diplomatic um, people, by people that are good in negotiating. They should do their job. They should have the chance to do it. The military g gave them the chance. Now it's time to put them, to give the stage to them. We can do it right now, but it seems like they don't want to do it and they do everything not to do it but they've got it they've got to do it because they, they're not going to survive they're going to come back all dead i want that offer will come back home alive we've got a family that's waiting for him palestinian president mahmoud abbas has appointed his longtime economic advisor mohammed mustafa to be the next prime minister to reform the palestinian authority mohammed mustafa is leading business figure in palestine his appointment comes after mounting pressure to overhaul and revitalize the governing body of the Palestinian territories and improve its governance in the West Bank, where it is based. Mustafa had, had helped organize the reconstruction of Gaza following a previous conflict. He replaces former Prime Minister Mohammed Shataya, who, along with his government, resigned in February. As president, Abbas still remains by far the most powerful figure in the Palestinian Authority, but the appointment of a new government was a demonstration of his willingness to meet international demands for a change in the administration. Well, Australia has become the latest country to resume funding to the United Nations' main Palestinian relief agency. Australia had consulted with both UNRWA and other donor countries and was satisfied with the additional safeguards put in place. Australian Foreign Minister Penny Wong announced that some $3.9 million in paused funding will be released immediately. The resumption came after almost two months after it was paused ties over allegations some of the agency's employees participated in the October 7 Hamas terrorist attack. Sweden, Canada and the European Union have resumed funding to some degree. The organization's head said, he cautiously optimistic uh, other donors would resume funding soon. And still to come on DD News Hour. SpaceX's Starship rocket designed to send astronauts to the moon and beyond completed nearly an entire test flight on its third try. Fear of deadly bird flu virus in Antarctic. Scientists issued warning.
Rio's luxury palace hotel opened the French artist Daniel Burin's artwork. Stay with us to know more. We are taking a close look at the phenomenon of military bases, military infrastructure and military facilities in the maritime domain and what they do to enhance a country's naval power. We are the ones who are uh, you know, assuring them that we will help each and every smaller country, mm. whether it is you want infrastructure from us, we will go and provide it, you want ships, you want boats or you want any kind of help. A bigger nation is there to help you out. Why have the big five powers of the United Nations Security Council seen no change in eight decades? Who is stalling reform of the world body and for how long can we wait? Are we truly alone in the universe? Or are there aliens who keep playing hide and seek with us? Watch Connecting the Dots to get the full picture every Friday at 8 p.m. IST on DD India. I'm at the entrance of Sela Tunnel, which is more than 13,000 feet high. This tunnel provides an all weather access, especially to the armed forces and also very convenient for the civilians. It was unimaginable and I also like to express my uh, heartiest thanks and congratulations to the Border Roads organizations. This tunnel system, both Tunnel 1 and Tunnel 2, that we don't have to climb time to pass and no matter what the weather, we will be able to access the one. At the very outset, I'd like to give, pay my huge gratitude to Prime Minister Narendra Modi. I'm very happy now I can able to go wherever I want. Hey, vatan, vatan mere abad rahe tu, main jaha rahu jaha mein yaad rahe tu, main jaha rahu jaha mein yaad rahe tu, hey, vatan, mere vatan. Voice of a rising aspirational world. Stories of challenges, struggles and accomplishments. A world battling conflict, hunger and poverty. Embracing growth, development, science and technology. A voice of progress, a voice of unity. Watch Voice of the Global South with me, Akshay Dongre, only on DD India. You're watching DD India News Hour. I'm Siddharth Bharadwaj. NATO troops, ships and aircrafts are taking part in NATO exercises in Europe's high north. Some 90,000 troops from the United States and fellow NATO allied nations are taking part in the Steadfast Defender 2024 drills. It started in late January and will run through May all over Europe. Vice Commander US Second Fleet Rear Admiral David Pachel, he said the high north part of the exercise had been focusing on transatlantic reinforcement and has included maritime live exercises and amphibious assault training in the North Atlantic and Arctic seas. In addition, more than 50 ships from aircraft carriers to destroyers, over 80 fighter jets, helicopters and drones, and at least 1,100 combat vehicles will also take part. Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. will be meeting U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken early next week to tackle cooperation and security matters. Marcos vowed to defend the Philippines' maritime claims after Chinese President Xi Jinping called on the armed forces to coordinate preparations for military conflicts at sea. Their meeting comes on the heels of heightened tensions between the Philippines and China over territorial disputes in the South China Sea. A 2016 ruling by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague found that China's sweeping claims had no legal basis, but Beijing has rejected the ruling, claiming indisputable sovereignty over most of the South China Sea. Well, DD India correspondent Laura Westbrook joins us from Hong Kong with more details. Laura, tell us what has Marco said ahead of the meeting between him and Secretary Blinken?
Yes, as you mentioned, the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, will be heading to the Philippines. He'll be going to Manila and he will be meeting with the Philippine president. The US is, of course, a key ally of the Philippines. And his visit comes hot on the heels of another visit by a US uh, uh, official, uh, the US Commerce Secretary, who was also in the Philippines this week. Now, uh, the Philippines says the meetings will focus on areas of cooperation and security, and this all comes against that backdrop of rising tensions in the South China Sea between the Philippines and China, both claiming maritime uh, claims there. Now, the Philippine president has vowed to defend the Philippines' maritime claims. He says, we will continue to do what we can to defend our maritime territory in the face of perhaps a more active attempt by the Chinese to annex some of our territory. Now, of course, the South China Sea is one of the world's busiest shipping claims. Trillions of dollars of trade pass through it every year. As you mentioned, uh, China claims almost the entire South China Sea. This is despite le legal precedents and also competing claims from not just the Philippines, but Vietnam, Malaysia and Brunei. Laura, the meeting will come at a time of heightened tensions between the Philippines and China with the South China Sea. Now, what can we expect? Yeah, um, tensions have been rising between the two countries recently. Just last week, the Philippines accused uh, Chinese vessels of a collision with one of its resupply missions. It says it accused China of dangerous maneuvers, and it said that Chinese ships were involved in two separate collisions, one of which uh, involved water cannon against one of its ships. Now, China says that its coast guards had taken measures against a Philippine vessel that intruded into its waters. And Washington had even waded in and it issued a statement on this incident. It said that incidents represented China's di reckless disregard for the safety of Filipinos and for international law. So that just gives you a sense of the backdrop of what's going on in the region ahead of uh, the U.S. Uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken's visit to Manila, one of its key allies. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Laura, for joining in. While visiting Gloucester Rugby Club on Thursday, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said his Conservative Party is united in making sure the UK won't have a Labour government. The British Prime Minister is under pressure from his own party as some members want to have a new leader before general elections later this year. He acknowledged that the country has been through a difficult couple of years but said Britain is now going in the right direction. I said, I think the, actually the party is united in wanting to make sure that we don't have the Labour government because our plan is the right one for the country. And actually, we've been through a difficult couple of years. Of course, that's the case, whether it's with COVID, recovering from that, the impact of the war in Ukraine. But at the start of this year, we really have turned a corner and we're now pointing in the right direction. You Argentina's Senate voted to reject President Javier Millet's December presidential decree that rolled out a series of economic reforms. The decree faces a second vote in the country's lower house. The decree, which originally contained over 600 articles, was rejected in a vote of 42 to 25 with four abstentions and can only be definitely discarded if it is also rejected by Argentina's lower house. The president's party has a minority in both chambers. Millet, an outsider economist whose party has a minority in Congress, took office in December and used his powers of presidential decree to roll out measures ranging from privatizations to labor reforms. The government of Nepal has confirmed that seven more Nepalese serving in the Russian army have lost their lives. In a statement, the Foreign Ministry of Nepal said that the government has continued its diplomatic efforts with top priority to repatriate Nepalese recruited in the Russian army. The ministry reiterated Nepal's policy not to allow Nepalese citizens to recruit in foreign countries' armies except for some under the traditionally existing agreement. In Haiti, violence appeared to flare up again after a brief lull following Prime Minister's Ariel Andre announcement of resignation on Monday. 
A powerful gang leader has issued a threatening message aimed at political leaders who would participate in a planned transition council. Meanwhile, a fire broke out at the main penitentiary emptied of prisoners by armed men earlier this month. Thick black smoke earlier billowed out from the facility, but the fire appeared to be out by Thursday afternoon. National Police Chief's house had also been set on fire on Thursday. Heavily armed gangs have taken over much of the capital and rights groups have reported widespread killings, kidnappings and sexual violence. Nearby countries continue to bolster their border security and withdrew staff from embassies while plans to send a long-awaited international security force remain uncertain. Britain said on Thursday it had agreed a security package to protect the borders of the Turks and Caicos Islands, a British overseas territory, in response to the risk violence in Haiti could spread. Britain said the Turks and Caicos Islands had been experiencing a surge in violent crime and last month sent specialist firearms and investigators. In 2022, it deployed a serious crime team there. SpaceX's Starship rocket designed to send astronauts to the moon and beyond completed nearly an entire test flight on its third try on Thursday, making it farther than before through a cruise in low orbit. However, according to SpaceX, the rocket was destroyed during atmospheric re-entry. During a webcast of the flight, SpaceX commentators said Mission Control lost communication with Starship from two satellite systems simultaneously while the spacecraft was re-entering the planet's atmosphere at hypersonic speed. Thursday's flight achieved many of the engineering goals set for the mission, a repeat of successful stage separation during initial ascent, the first test of Starship's ability to open and close its payload door in orbit, and the transfer of super-cooled rocket propellant from one tank to another during space flight. Still, Musk is counting on Starship to fulfill his goal of producing a large multi-purpose next-generation spacecraft capable of sending people and cargo to the moon later this decade and ultimately flying to Mars. Scientists in the Antarctic are warning of the spread of deadly bird flu virus after the disease was first detected on the frozen continent's mainland last month and has since been detected in local penguin and uh, Comorin populations. Scientists have warned that another pandemic might be underway as cases of bird flu known as H5N1 goes up. The spread of virus, which has decimated bird populations worldwide, has raised alarms about the potential impact on the frozen region's huge penguin colonies. The flu was first detected in nine Adelie penguins and one Antarctic cormorant. Argentina grappled with intense rains after month with reconstruction works where the downpour tore downpour rooftops and prompted authorities to declare an orange alert and cancel flights on Tuesday. Authorities of Buenos Aires put the city to alert yellow, warning of potential damages and disruption in daily life activities. So far this week, the rainfall has surpassed March's unusual rainwater volume. Wildfires burns amid a dense residential area in Chile's central port city of Vaparaiso. Firefighters works to put out the blaze which comes a month after deadly wildfires devastated central Chile in early February. At least 133 people died in the February fires which marks the country's deadliest natural disaster since 2010. Deadly wildfires are expected to become more likely in South American country as the world becomes hotter and drier with climate change. Workers removes mud from La Paz after heavy rains continued unabatedly in Bolivia's capital, damaging nearby houses. The heavy rain in Bolivia's capital prompted authorities to declare a state of emergency on Sunday after overflowing rivers destroyed many houses. Bolivian President Luis Arce pledged to send heavy machinery and troops to prevent further damage. Many residents walked on the sides as the risen waters wiped out to the path.
The star-studded cast of film Ghostbusters Frozen Empire dazzled as they hit the red carpet for the premiere of the film in New York on Thursday. Original Ghostbusters cast members including Bill Murray joined the new batch of actors including Paul Rudd, Finn Wolfhard. The film is slated for a theatrical release on, theatrical on Friday, 22nd of March. All right, let's take a look at other stories making news around the world. Grammy-winning singer Nora Jones surprised onlookers as she sings her famous hits in a London train station. The pianos in the main arcade became part of the railway station's furniture in 2012 when the City of London Festival celebrated its golden anniversary and public performances have since become an institution. The Concorde supersonic aircraft returned to its home at the Intrepid Museum in Manhattan after repair and restoration. The Concorde has been housed at the Intrepid Museum since 2003. The Concorde was a supersonic airplane built in the 1960s as part of a joint venture between the UK and France. The Concorde was the first commercial aircraft of its kind. Rio's luxury palace hotel opened the French artist Daniel Buren's artwork displaying chromatic facade balconies as part of a world scattered six art pieces project. The emblematic hotel's windows facing the iconic Brazilian beach were covered with colorful light, making it a 24 hour artwork. The palace to showcase art exhibit till September 30th. And still to come on DD Indian News R. The High Level Committee on One Nation, One Election submits its report. For the first time, the Odisha Lalit Kala Academy hosts Odisha Tribal Artists Camp in Dubai. People covered each other in colours as they played Herbal Holi, a festival of colours in the North Indian state of Mathura. Stay tuned for more details. Powers of the United Nations Security Council seen no change in eight decades. Who is stalling reform of the world body and for how long can we wait? truly alone in the universe or are there aliens who keep playing hide and seek with us watch connecting the dots to get the full picture every friday at 8 pm ist on dd india you're watching dd india news all i'm sadhar bharadwaj and let's have a look at the headlines once again Polls open in Russian presidential election. Putin set for another comeback. Urges Russians to unite in conflict with Ukraine. In a tragic incident, over 60 people feared drowned on a vessel carrying migrants across the Mediterranean from Libya to Italy or Malta. Colorado seeing what may be the U.S. state's biggest snowstorm of the season, knocking out power, closing roads and causing flight delays. Bhutanese Prime Minister Shering Topge is on five-day visit to India to meet President Draupadi Murmu today and also to visit Raj Ghat in the national capital. India issues joint statement with other countries in United Nations General Assembly. Resolution calls for member states to promote safe, secure and trustworthy AI systems to address the world's greatest challenges. The India along with United States and 53 other members have proposed a first United Nations resolution on artificial intelligence aimed at ensuring the new technology is safe, secure and trustworthy and that all countries, especially those in the developing world, have equal access. The resolution calls on member states to promote safe, secure and trustworthy AI systems to address the world's greatest challenges, including those related to poverty elimination, global health, 
food security, climate, energy and education. Members resolved to bridge the artificial intelligence and other digital divides between and within countries through capacity building, increasing digital literacy and other actions. Statement establishes a shared vision that AI systems should be human-centric, reliable, explainable, ethical, inclusive, privacy-preserving and responsible with a sustainable development orientation and in full respect, promotion and protection of human rights and international law. And it affirms principles that will help make that vision a reality. This resolution is a historic step forward in fostering safe, secure and trustworthy AI worldwide. Bhutanese Prime Minister sharing top gaze on a five-day official visit to India at the invitation of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The Prime Minister of Bhutan will meet President Draupadi Murmu today and visit Raj Ghat in the national capital. Earlier on Thursday, Bhutanese Prime Minister sharing top gaze met Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi in New Delhi. The visit of Bhutanese Prime Minister will provide an opportunity to the two sides to review the partnership progress. This is his first overseas visit after assuming office in January 2024. Taking on social media platform X, PM Modi wrote, and I quote, Glad to meet my friend and PM of Bhutan sharing Dobge on his first overseas visit in this term. Had productive discussions encompassing various aspects of our unique and special partnership. I convey heartfelt thanks to His Majesty the King of Bhutan and Bhutan PM for inviting me to visit Bhutan next week. The High Level Committee on One Nation, One Election has submitted its report. The committee was constituted on 2nd September 2023 and over 191 days conducted wide consultation with experts and citizens. It has recommended two phases of election. Simultaneous election to the Lok Sabha or House of the People and Vidhan Sabhas and state legislative assemblies and within 100 days elections to municipalities and local bodies. Here's a report. The High-Level Committee on Simultaneous Elections submitted its report to the President of India. It has 18,626 pages. The committee, headed by former President of India, Ramnath Kovind, conducted extensive consultations with stakeholders and experts over 191 days. 47 political parties submitted their views and suggestions, of which 32 supported simultaneous elections. Many political parties had extensive discussions on this matter. 21,558 responses were received from citizens all over India. 80% of the respondents supported simultaneous elections. Experts on law, including four former Chief Justices of India and 12 former Chief Justices of major high courts, four former Chief Election Commissioners, eight State Election Commissioners and Chairman Law Commission of India interacted in person with the committee. Views of the Election Commission of India were also sought. Industry bodies CII, FICI, SOCHAM and eminent economists were also consulted. They confirmed that asynchronous elections fueled inflation and slowed down the economy. They said intermittent elections adversely impacted economic growth, quality of public expenditure, educational and other outcomes and upset social harmony. The committee recommended a two-step approach to simultaneous elections. Simultaneous elections for the House of the People and the State Legislative Assemblies. In the second step, elections to municipalities, panchayats to be held within 100 days of elections to the House of People and the State Legislative Assemblies. The committee recommends that there should be a single electoral roll and electoral photo identity cards for use in elections to all the three tiers of government. The committee crafted its recommendations so that they are in accordance with the spirit of the Constitution of India and would require the bare minimum amendments to the Constitution to implement. 
The committee concluded that its recommendations will significantly enhance transparency, inclusivity, confidence and ease of the voters. The overwhelming support for holding simultaneous elections will spur development, improve social cohesion, deepen the foundations of democracy and realize the aspirations of India, that is Bharat. The other members of the committee were India's Home Minister, Amit Shah, former Upper House Leader of the Opposition, Gulam Nabi Azad, former Chairman of the 15th Finance Commission, N. K. Singh and Dr. Subhash C. Kashyap, former Secretary General, Lok Sabha. Other members of the committee were Harish Salve, Senior Advocate, Sanjay Kothari, former Chief Vigilance Commissioner, Arjun Ram Meghwal, India's Minister of Law and Justice, was a special invitee, and Dr. Nitin Chandra was the committee secretary. Bureau Report, DD India. India's President Draupadi Murmu appointed bureaucrats Sukhbir Sandhu and Gyanesh Kumar as election commissioners in Election Commission of India with effect from the date of assumption of charge of their office. Newly appointed election commissioners Gyanesh Kumar and SS Sandhu to take charge today. Sandhu is from Punjab and is a former IAS officer of 1988 batch from Uttarakhand Kader. On the other hand, Gyanesh Kumar has served as secretary in the Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs. He belongs to the 1988 batch from Kerala Kader. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi will be visiting southern states of Tamil Nadu and Kerala ahead of the upcoming Lok Sabha elections. He will address a public meeting at Nagakoil city in Tamil Nadu. Later in the day, he will visit Kerala where he will address a public meeting at uh, Pathanamitha. The Prime Minister will also hold a roadshow in Telangana's uh, Malkajgiri. Well, DD India correspondent Anabarsan joins us from Chennai. Anabarsan, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi will be visiting Tamil Nadu and will address a public meeting at Nagarkoil city as well. What latest do you have for us? Uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi visiting Tamil Nadu in the last three months. It's a fifth consecutive visit in the last three months. He visited uh, the first meet in uh, Trichy where he inaugurated the, uh, the uh, international terminal and Chennai for the Kelo uh, uh, India Youth Games and after Tutu Kurin and uh, Palladam public gathering. So all this event uh, in Trichy around 17,000 worth of uh, project he has been inaugurated and laid the foundation stone and Doti Gurin also he inaugurated and laid the foundation stone particularly for the ISTO new launching pad at Pikula Sikram Patnam uh, launching site and uh, after that he is uh, visiting uh, Nagarkoil the Kanyakumari district uh, and attending the public gathering at around 11 a.m. today and where he is uh, addressing the public gathering at the Vivekananda College ground. Uh, this visit uh, makes a significant for the upcoming Lok, Lok Sabha election because uh, the Kanyakumari uh, constituency has, has been uh, considered so one of the home top for the BJP. And uh, last consecutive uh, 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 various terms, BJS, BJP has been winning this uh, Lok Sabha uh, seat uh, from the Vajpayee period onwards. Uh, one Radha Krishna, the candidate uh, before that, has been won this uh, Kanyakumari seat and uh, become a MOS of, for the Ministry of Finance. And so this visit to the Kanyakumari dis district uh, makes a significant part of the upcoming Lok Sabha election. And also the recent MLA from Congress joined the uh, BJP, uh, Vijay Dharni also joined. So she also from the uh, Kanyakumari constituency. Uh, so it makes a more important for this uh, Kanyakumari district and uh, the constituency that Prime Minister is addressing. At around 11 a.m. is uh, addressing the gathering at the Vivekananda Ground College ground in the uh, Kanyakumari uh, in Nagar Koyal, near Dagatishwara. And uh, this, uh, so after that, he is visiting uh, Patanam Thita in Kerala and also visiting uh, uh, Coimbatore and uh, attending a public uh, uh, rally at Salem. So, across all this uh, three months, Prime Minister's continuous visit to the Tamil Nadu, particularly. Uh, for the launching of various development uh, program and uh, schemes. So it, uh, it continuously boosting uh, Tamil Nadu's economy and uh, more on that. So Prime Minister visit makes uh, particularly visited uh, southern part to Tukurin just uh, two weeks before uh, and after that he is visiting here. So all this visit 
and also he is appealing to the public regarding uh, the government achievement uh, for the modi's guarantee and the various uh, worth of around uh, around 10 lakh crore has been uh, uh, given to the tamil nadu for last 10 year uh, as uh, prime minister mentioned in the previous meet in ymca nandanam chennai mm. where he addressed the public gathering there also so prime ministers uh, continuous outreach and uh, meeting with uh, various uh, dignitaries in the state and it makes more uh, all right uh, reach in, reach into the state uh, anubarsan yeah. so, uh, are there any specific issues or agendas that prime minister modi is expected to highlight during his public addresses and road show uh last meet uh, prime minister is uh, morely emphasized the uh, drug uh, related issues in tamil nadu hmm. and uh, recently the state president uh, bjp president has uh, 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 demonstrated a protest in chennai regarding a uh, recent uh, various uh, actually national, uh, national narcotics bureau has been uh, 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 observed and uh, various of uh, drug related activities in the chennai and across tamil nadu and uh, it's around a, a close of worth uh, that has been seized from various places so this prime minister also uh, emphasized in the last ymc a meet and also prime minister maybe uh, will uh, likely to emphasize on that and also the prime minister continuously whenever he visit tamil nadu is focused on the uh, family uh, politics uh, dynastic politics that uh, that is also maybe uh, he may em- emphasize on the kanya kumari uh, this public gathering and this kanya kumari uh, uh, all right constituency it's the kind of a home for the bjp all right. so it, it will be a more enthusiastic and uh, Indeed. energetic uh, Indeed. meet Indeed. well really with that thank you so much anbarsan for joining in and for the first time the orissa lalit kala academy hosted an orissan tribal artists camp in dubai that concluded on thursday the three day event featured live creation of tribal paintings offering spectators a rare glimpse into the intricate process of tribal art forms a ceremonial inauguration marked the unveiling of the completed paintings attended by sudarshan patnaik renowned sand artist and president of orissa lalit kala academy and consul general of india satish sivan The initiative is expected to bridge the gap in international awareness of Odisha's dynamic tribal art scene. We took the 15 artists from Odisha different villages and they did their traditional tribal paintings on canvas. So it is a great honor for us and also for the painting I have drawn the details of the tribal cultures in which they celebrate every moment of their life and this is the power of this is a festival called ba parav and then in this there is a ritual of sacrificing an animal so i have shown them the three messages there so that the i have left this group groups to run away to save animals The Sri Lanka India Society commemorated 75th Republic Day of India and the 76th Independence Day of Sri Lanka with a commemorative dinner in Colombo on Thursday. Sri Lanka President Ranil Wickremasinghe attended the event as the chief guest emphasized the significance of the strong bilateral relations between the two nations. To me, what is special on this 75th anniversary is now we are giving, into, putting into effect the vision statement that I signed with Prime Minister Modi. We have always dealt with our cultural affiliations, with our religious affiliations, fact that we are poly, we are both democracies, fact that we have the British system of law. but what we have forgotten is that the trade and the economic relationship between sri lanka and india i think it goes back even beyond the cultural stage Indian Ministry of Minority Affairs has approved a proposal from the University of Delhi to establish the Center for Advanced Studies in Buddhism. The center will include various courses in Buddhist studies like undergraduate, postgraduate, PhD and research program. 
The university will collaborate with subject matter expertise on research projects related to Buddhist studies, encouraging faculty members and students to undertake interdisciplinary research that contributes to the understanding and preservation of Buddhist culture and language. The university will also collaborate with the ministry to enhance educational opportunities for minority communities in the country. And let's take a look at other stories making news. India's Ministry of Coal launched the third tranche of e-auction of critical and strategic minerals on Thursday. A total of seven critical mineral blocks are being put up for auction as composite license. These seven blocks pertains to critical minerals such as gloconite, graphite, nickel, PGE, potash, lithium and titanium and are spread across the different states. People covered each other in colours as they played Herbal Holi, a festival of colours in the north Indian state of Mathura. In uh, the north Indian city, in fact. People gathered at uh, Ramanriti Ashram and played with colours and flowers. And still to come on DD News R. Yannick Sinha continues his perfect start to the season, beats Jiri Lecheka. Lakshya Sain beats Danish world number four Anders and Townsend in All England Open Championship. How the battle on court unfolded, we will tell you. of Sela Tunnel which is more than 13,000 feet high. This tunnel provides an all-weather access especially to the armed forces and also very convenient for the civilians. It was unimaginable and I also like to express my uh, heartiest thanks and congratulations to the Border Roads organizations. This tunnel system, both Tunnel 1 and Tunnel 2, that we don't have to climb time to pass and no matter what the weather, we will be able to access the one. At the very outset, I'd like to give, pay my huge gratitude to Prime Minister Narendra Modi. I'm very happy. Now I can able to go wherever I want. Why have the big five powers of the United Nations Security Council seen no change in eight decades? Who is stalling reform of the world body and for how long can we wait? Are we truly alone in the universe or are there aliens who keep playing hide and seek with us? Watch. Connecting the dots to get the full picture every Friday at 8 p.m. IST on DD India. News R. I am Siddharth Bharadwaj. U.S. President Joe Biden opposes the proposed. $14.9 billion merger of U.S. Steel Corp. X and with Japan's Nippon Steel, stating that the company must remain domestically owned and operated. Biden said United States needs to maintain strong American steel companies powered by American steel workers. He added that U.S. Steel has been an iconic American steel company for more than a century and it is vital for it to remain an American steel company that is domestically owned and operated. Biden called United Steel Workers International President David McCall to reiterate that he has the steel workers back. The union embraced Biden's stance. JP Morgan Chase and Co has been fined 348.2 million dollars by US bank regulators over its inadequate program to monitor firm and client trading activities for market misconduct. Federal Reserve and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency fined the company. The misconduct occurred between 2014 and 2023. The OCC said JP Morgan failed to properly monitor billions of trades across at least 30 global trading venues. Are you watching DD News? Our time now for sport. 
Indian charter Lakshya Sen came off from behind on Thursday to beat Danish world number no. 4 Anders and Donson in the All England Open Championship. This was the first win for Lakshya against and Donson in their last four matches. Next Lakshya will take on former All England champion Lee Zijia on Friday. Lakshya is leading 3-1 against the Malaysian Shuttler. Meanwhile, world number one duo of Satvik Sai Raj Ranki Reddy and Chirag Shetty lost to former All England champions Am Fikri and Maulana 16-21, 15-21 in the second round. In the women's singles, two-time Olympic medalist PV Sindhu suffered a straight games defeat against South Korean An Seong. In women's doubles, Tanisha Krasto and Ashwini Punapa also went out in the round of 16 after taking the opening game against Zhang and Zheng of China. This leaves Lakshya Sen to be the only Indian contention in the quarterfinal stage and PV Sindhu, Satvik Chirag, Ashwini, Tanisha made their way out. Well, Yannick Sinha continued his perfect start to the season by cruising into the Indian Wells semi-finals on Thursday, dispatching Jiri Lechheka 6-3, 6-3 to improve his win across uh, Will loss record this year to 16-0. The Italians return to the final four in California's desert, set up a possible rematch with Spain's Carlos Ecaraz, who ended his title bid at the same stage a year ago. Meanwhile, American 17th seed Tommy Paul also progressed to the semis as he wowed his home crowd with a 6-2, 1-6-6-3 win over Norway's Casper Rudd. Meanwhile, in women's singles, top seed Iga Swiatek reached the semi-finals at the Indian Wells after former world number one Caroline Wozniacki retired with an apparent foot injury on Thursday. Wozniacki started strongly as she raised into a 4-1 lead, but she was soon left frustrated as Swiatek produced a barrage of wins to storm back and win the set. The Dane gestured to her opponent that she was unable to continue after having trouble with the problem on her right foot once Sweetek had taken a 1-0 lead in the second set. Sweetek will face Marta Kostyuk for a place in the final after the Ukrainian defeated Anastasia Potapova of Russia 6-0-7-5. Well, in the carnival of the Indian Premier League, the stage is set for another exciting season. Defending champions Chennai Super Kings brace themselves for a battle at their revered fortress, the M. A. Chidambaram Stadium. All eyes are on the enigmatic captain Mahindra Singh Dhoni. Another season, another title aspiration. Holders Chennai Super Kings are set to launch their Indian Premier League title defence at their beloved fortress, the M. A. Chidambaram Stadium, where they will take on Royal Challengers Bangalore on March 2022. While CSK are tied with Mumbai Indians as the team to have won most IPL titles, the Yellow Army have also been runner-ups five times in the 14 seasons CSK have competed in. They have made the finals ten times, a staggering number which reflects their dominance in the cash-rich league. All eyes are on CSK captain Mahinder Singh Dhoni's role and degree of involvement with the team this season. The 42-year-old wicketkeeper nursed a knee injury in the previous season and despite pain and discomfort led his team all the way to the title. Dhoni underwent knee surgery soon after the final in May 2023 and has been nursing since. The former Indian captain has joined CSK squad in Chennai and is gearing up for the forthcoming IPL 2024 season. Players bought by Chennai Super Kings in mini auction: Rachin Ravindra, Shardul Thakur, Daryl Mitchell, Samir Rizvi, Mustafizur Rahman and Avinash Rao a well settled outfit which has historically never believed in too much of chopping and changing the yellow shirts once again look like strong contenders sports desk dd india and that's all for this edition of dd india news hour but let us know your thoughts on the news of the day you can connect with us on facebook x formerly known as twitter and instagram we'll be back with more news as it breaks here on dd india i am sadat bharadwaj from all of us here in delhi thanks for watching dd india news hour